they? And I'm I'm told it's it's an escalating trend or threat rather. Are you How talking about cyber attacks to the business? I am. I'm talking Holcro- Holcroft Group, LSH. We've mm-hmm. seen Pendragon, clearly very high profile case, and latterly Arnold Clark. Um, and we've spoken to a lot of those groups, and you know there is. An awful lot of things. Do you want to tell me? Do you want me to tell you how scared I am? Go for it. Frightened to death. Welcome to the latest edition of the AM News Show podcast. I'm Tom Sharp, managing editor at AM Magazine. I'm not joined today by my colleague Tim Rose, uh, who's busy structurally aligning all our content to uh, to align with a new uh, digital makeover and transition transition at am so do be sure to register for all of that online i am however joined by marketing deliveries chief executive jeremy evans and swans way group director peter smythe great to have you both in the studio today jeremy evans uh, ceo at marketing delivery welcome to the studio nice to be here our usual quick fire questions that we like to fire at people i'm very interested to know first of all how you got into the automotive sector so i was uh, of all things a boot store manager um and the bit of the job that excited me most was marketing uh, decided to specialize in marketing i started looking for marketing jobs um i'm also a petrol head so i saw a marketing job uh with ford advertise which was at the time called service marketing specialist which was uh, at a base at a ford dealer um, but a ford kind of sponsored role if you like um, and I thought that looks that looks interesting. It's cars, it's marketing. Sounds like a bit of me. Uh, applied for it, got the job. The rest, I guess, is history. <laughs> well, you run your own business, so there's a bit of a gap. There. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a bit of a gap. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what do you what do you love about the sector after years of working in it? Well, I guess it still it still gives me that kind of excitement of uh, as I said, I, I love cars, so I love the, the that kind of whole environment of being around uh, cars and car people anyway. Um, but the evolution of the business um, and of the industry. So I didn't set out to run a tech company. Um, I quite often joke with my team that I've accidentally ended up running a tech company. I started a marketing company, but tech is everywhere. Marketing is tech. Um, and being able to react to things that go on in the industry I love with the products I love, with people I like being around, um, and you know, come up with thoughts, ideas, suggestions that people uh, are interested in and want to try. So there's that um, willingness to try new things, willingness to give things a go, um, and willingness to uh, yeah to, to listen to, to people, regardless of whether you're a massive OEM or a registered small supplier in the industry um, people are willing to to listen and, and give new ideas a go great stuff and if you could change something about the sector what would it be uh, I guess I'd like um, I'd like some of the OEMs to be a bit more open to some of the ideas that, that smaller businesses within the sector come up with um, you know speaking for myself we work with with dealerships from pretty much every manufacturer now um, but the doors can be uh, the barriers to entry at, at OEM level can, uh, can be quite significant um, whereas dealers are more open to talking to people dealers want best in class um, at whatever it, whatever it is whatever system it is whatever product it is whatever supplier it is they want best in class doesn't matter really how big or how small you are um, uh, but that's that's different at OEM level um, so yeah I'd like the OEMs just to be a little bit more uh, open thinking I guess and, and, and look at some of the other supplies in, in the industry not just us there are some cracking supplies in all areas in the industry and we're not all massive um, but there's some there's some really good agile companies out there doing things that, uh, that I think uh, yeah probably the, the OEMs would benefit from great stuff lovely thanks Jeremy okay. um, Peter Peter Smythe director at Swansway Group yep uh, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Um, just going to fire our quick fire three questions at you. And first of all, although I have an inkling of what your answer to the first one might be, I don't really know the story. How, how did you get into the automotive sector? I was in a family that you that are, was, that, you are that, still, that, that, and I still am in a family that um, <laughs> that was in the motor trade. But the reason, the, the way I fell into it, actually, um, I was at school. I did my. Uh, I think they were called all levels in those days. And I, I then went on to do uh, A-levels. And I took the three hardest subjects I think you possibly could take, chemistry, physics, and biology. Um, probably uh, parental pressure. I don't know that maybe do that. Anyway, failed dismally at that. Spoke to the school and decided that I would retake some uh, A-levels and drop down a year. Drop down a year. Did better than I did before, but then at the end I chickened out because I realised I hadn't done enough work. So I thought I need to somehow 
get a job. And uh, my parents were away on holiday in Tenerife. Um, and I was at home studying at Christmas for mock exams, mock uh, A-level exams. And I applied for a job in the paper at uh, Lex Service PLC, Lex Mead, which was an Austin Rover dealer, as a trainee salesperson. And that's how I fell into the business. And only latterly, I worked for Lex Service for a couple of years. And then I worked for a local Volvo dealer called Hindle & Walker, uh, Les Hindle & Matt Walker, back in the uh, in the 80s. Um and then 85, 86, I then went to work for Rackley Road Garage Company Limited, which was uh, now RRG, which was the uh, the uh, the business that my, uh, my father owned. So, so that's how I fell into it. He didn't let you in the door straight away? Uh, he wasn't happy when I ditched doing my A-levels, that's for sure. Yeah, we had, <laughs> there was a few conversations. What do you love about the sector? Um I like the people in the sector. I like the, the retail people in the sector. Um it's going to sound a bit cheesy, but because it's a family business, I um, I enjoy working with um, with my father and particularly David and John. And now the next generation is starting to uh, come into the business. So David's sons uh, in the business, John's sons in the business. So uh, I enjoy that. Excellent, love it. If there was one thing you could change about the sector, what would that be? Uh, well. The thing that I'd like to change, and uh, Jeremy, it's, it's virtually the exact same as you. I just wish that the OEMs had more faith in the dealers and listened to the dealers and maybe listen to the dealers more than they may listen to um, management consultants. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Lovely. Thanks for your time, guys. Much appreciated. Cheers, Tom. Lots, lots to talk about. Um, we'll try and keep it as as snappy as ever. Um, but I guess we'll start easy and ease our way in, Peter. Uh, how's how's twenty twenty three started for you so far? The group, as well as yourself as an individual. <coughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it, it, it started all right for uh, for me. Um, my girlfriend tells me I should lose a little bit of weight, but apart from that, <laughs> not too bad. Twenty twenty three's been a surprisingly good start. Um, we've obviously, like most uh, retail dealers, had a great 2021 20, and indeed 2022. And we were a little bit sceptical about 2023 and where we should pitch our budgets and whatnot. But um, at the end of quarter one, we should comfortably exceed where we thought we would be. Um, and looking to have again a very very prosperous uh, 2023 so um not a real an awful lot of complaints on on, on that front is yeah is is the outlook for for supply the concern that it was 6 12 months ago that i mean i think i, I are you talking speaking, new are you talking newer used cars uh, both i guess but one kind of knocks on from the other but in a delayed fashion so we're, we're already in that delayed period aren't we really now for used well, we're definitely right in the throes of it because there are two and a half million new cars that weren't registered during the pandemic era, if you like, um, that would now, some of them would now be approaching the first MOT. And um, so they're, they're what I would call proper used cars, uh, and they're not there. And consequently, prices are holding up extremely well. Um, certainly internal combustion engine cars are. Um, the best thing is another subject which I'm sure we may want to talk about later. Um, I, so the supply of, 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 of used cars is a challenge, but the margins that we're still able to take are still very respectable. Um, with regard to supply of new cars, I actually thought by now it would have freed up more than it has. And it was looking in January and February as though it was going to really free up. But I think there have been a few logistical glitches in March in getting, because a lot of cars obviously come over the water because we're an island. And I think there's been a few logistical uh, glitches in getting enough boats to get the cars over from uh, whatever ports they come from, say Emden in Germany, to over to uh, to the UK. So the um, we're not actually it, with a lot of our brands working towards the usual twelve month contracts. 
we're working on a month by month basis still. And I think that's probably going to continue for the next, certainly for the next quarter two. Yeah. I think we spoke this time last year, roughly. Yeah. And certainly one brand, you you said at that point, you'd sort of sold your quota for the year. There's not, there's not that situation this year. I'm um, well, there are, um, the, 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 we're now in the phase of supplying a lot of those cars. Um, I think it's fair to say, though, um, certainly with um, some derivatives, we've had quite a lot of cancelled orders, uh, which we've had to uh, to cope with. Um, there have been no surprise as to what derivatives uh, they are. Um, but we're in the position where we're fulfilling those orders now, Um and taking orders for cars now, new orders, which we should be able to fulfil within 20 weeks. Wow. Oh, that's, that's some improvement on, on where we were. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and I didn't know if we'd get onto agency quite this quickly, but you know I'm coming straight to you, Peter. I mean, what... What 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 are your what's your take on it at the moment? Where does Swan's Way stand in the whole agency sort of story? I guess you you've obviously partners that are transitioning that way. <clears throat> all our partners uh, from yes, all of our partners are transitioning onto one form of agency model or another. Um, where do I stand on agency? Um, it's coming. We will have to deal with it. I think it's going to create a larger problem for the national sales company than it is for the dealer. I actually believe the agency will favour the average dealer who's been very average at what he or she has done. It may actually favour the smaller dealer the dealer who is going to lose out are the aggressive, go-getting, um, hard-tasking um, retailers. And I think I'd characterise Swans Way in that group. We will definitely lose out by having this form of agency model. Um, but we're not going to uh, stand still and, 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 and take it. We, uh, we're going to react by getting better in other areas of the business, which we're already heavily focused on, um, particularly contract hire and, and used cars. Uh, because quite frankly, I can see our profits falling. Um, I can see our profits. I, 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 I believe that our profits will fall with the agency model by 40%. Wow. Which is a huge, wow. huge number. Yeah. Um, and if anybody else has done the maths or math, if you're American, uh, you'll find that that will be the case. Um, and therefore, you know, I, I'm used to having a, um, a certain standard of living, as ha are the people who work for me. Um, we can't tolerate that. So we've got to react and do something um, against it. And um, we will, as a, a dealer group, certainly not be on our own um, and we will have to um, uh, look uh, at other opportunities within the motor trade to uh, to get that income back I mean we've we've seen around the world different different sort of dealer groups pushing back against various brands you know mm. be it Mercedes or Honda or mm -hmm. more recently JLR mm. We've not really seen that in the UK. The response, I guess, from you is typical that we have to be a bit more un entrepreneurial and look for new avenues well, the of fact profit. Of the, the fact of the matter is, okay, if I've, I've been in this job now for 35 years, right? And if you're going to go to court against a huge organisation, you might well win and you might get a few quid. But really, at the end of the day, are you going to carry on having a relationship with that OEM? The stri strike answer to it is, no, you're not. You know, if the, P if the, if the, de the Mercedes-Benz dealers in Australia win their action, do you seriously think that Mercedes-Benz are going to say, oh, everything's all right, here's a big lump of money, and now let's carry on as it was before? Um, my family is committed to being in the motor trade, um, and we've got to be a little bit like Clint Eastwood in Heartbreak Ridge. We've got to improvise. We've got to adapt. We've got to overcome. 
Yeah, absolutely. What about? I mean, what we've what we've seen increasingly in recent weeks, which I find extremely exciting. After all, these recent years of reporting cuts, cuts, slash, and shrink. Mm. Is is these Chinese brands coming in and saying we're going to establish a, a retail network? Which I mean, it's Cherry, it's BYD, even Genesis now are looking mm. for for retail partners uh, on a smaller scale. So. Uh, are you, uh, has Swan's Way looked at that and perhaps yeah, we are. We're, 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 we're having negotiations with a number of the um, of the new entrants, and the fact of the matter is, we've got to because what is of concern to me is all the OEMs that we deal with are saying, "Look, you are going to receive a smaller percentage margin." But don't worry, the average price of our vehicles is going to increase because of battery electric vehicles. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so what's the man on the street going to drive? Because he sure as heck cannot afford a £70,000 car. Yeah. You know, Ford, and I'm, I'm looking at this table and I, and, I, and, I, and I see a picture of a 1980s XR2 and I can remember that uh, advert. I'm not old enough to remember the Anglia advert, by the way, from 1967, um, although my dad would. Um, but, um, you know, these people still need transportation. They still need mobility. Um, and, you know, Ford is saying... We're going to. Uh, we're not going to sell the uh, Fiesta or a small vehicle anymore because we cannot make it profitable. Well, something's got to give. Um, so I think that the Chinese and these newcomers will come in and they will, or, and have the ability to perhaps take up the slack there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so let's my, not let's not forget that XR2 was was the flagship vehicle. I wonder what what the average proportion with the of someone's pot alloys. I can yeah. see it now. Yeah. What, what was the proportion of someone's income that they spent on an XR2? You know, compared to what you might be looking to spend on an EV nowadays. It's well, a social actually, mobility if, issue. If, isn't if it? you actually think back and, and and you think back to cars in the nineties, they actually were quite expensive. You know. Um, it was only rip off Britain in 2000 that brought the price of, of, of vehicles down uh, in this country. Um, so, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is the general public, uh, the number of times that I, I can be at, the, um, at, at my gym and somebody will come up to me and say, oh, you're in the car business. Yeah, uh, well, I'm fancying um, a Range Rover Evoque, but I've only got £250 a month to spend, right? <laughs> and there were deals that went around, you know, sort of like three, four years ago, 299 399 Those days are sadly over. Yeah. Um, there's been a reality check uh, uh, gone on there. Uh, but, you know, the, you know, the man on the street... Will st or the woman on the street uh, being politically correct, they still need transportation. They still need to travel Absolutely. that 40 minutes to get to work. And, you know, if the pandemic's shown one thing, they don't want to go by bus or train. Mm. And if, if you look at the market share of, of people like the Fords and Vauxhalls of the day mm. and look at what's happening in the market now, consumers have shown they're quite happy to ditch the badge and go with the value product, the product that, that, it, that they can afford, that looks interesting, that looks different, that looks exciting, um, rather than the, the, the Ford, the Vauxhall, the Volkswagen, which traditionally have been the big three that people have always had. People, you know, look what ha what's happened to Kia and Hyundai in, in the last, what, 15 years? Where they, where they come from and where they are now, uh, and and who's to say that won't happen with the new Chinese entrance? In the case, given given ten fifteen years, will they will that top ten of, of vehicles sold each month that comes out from SMMT have some names in it that we've never heard of now? I, I, what what always staggered me, I I I remember being in the motor trade in nineteen ninety when when Toyota launched Lexus in the UK, and that Lexus LS four hundred was a groundbreaking car. 30 odd years ago um, and in fairness it has struggled in the UK maybe not in America to actually knock the big three German premium players off the perch even though the car is well, or was or still is probably a better car what surprised me with Tesla when somebody said to me, there's this guy called Elon Musk and he's going to bring these electric vehicles and they're going to be 70, 80,000 pounds. I thought at first, guy's not got a chance. But I mean, just look how many Teslas have been. Uh, so, so when it comes to tech vehicles, people do not seem 
to be as uh, bothered about the uh, the badge that's on the front of yeah. the car. Yeah, no, a, a car retailer's leverage in marketing communications to to educate the customers on on EV and new brands. Uh, and... Short answer, no. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're, we've just kicked off a big piece of work um, to look at the EV customer journey. Uh, we we as a company put an EV on a couple of years ago to to do that, to, to understand what the EV customer journey looks like from a sales perspective, after sales and ownership perspective. Um, and, you know, we, we have clients who are selling these vehicles who we're talking to and saying, what do we need to be saying to your customers about EVs? And and it's kind of blank looks back. Um, I was in I was at NADA in, in Dallas uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and there was a session by Cox Automotive talking about uh, EVs in particular. Um, and one of the dealers in the room expressed concern that they weren't going to see EVs as often as they, they see ICE vehicles because they're still doing 6,000 mile oil changes over there on, on ICE vehicles. And when are we going to see the EVs? Um, but actually Cox's response was, well, you're seeing EVs in, in dealers more than ICE vehicles at the minute because of recalls, because of warranties, because of uh, software updates and and tech issues that that they need to to be at a, de- at a dealer for. We all know EVs are here and everybody's been kind of forced into them. Although interesting was it last week uh, in Germany, Porsche and their by definition the wider Volkswagen Group um, suggested to the German government that if vehicles could run on synthetic fuels then mm-hmm. they should be exempt from the ban on ICE sales. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's happening in Italy as well. I think Ferrari are the headline name behind it, but obviously mm-hmm. Stellantis will be involved in that as well. Um, but if Germany and Italy say to the EU, your ICE ban can't include vehicles that can run on synthetic fuels, because I think Porsche are the people that have invested heavily in how synthetic fuels work and, and getting refined to the to the place where, uh, where, where they're now usable, uh, Formula One is switching to synthetic fuels, and if the Mercedes engines in Formula One run on synthetic fuels, you bet your bottom dollar that the AMG version of whatever car three or four years later will be able to run on it as well. If manufacturers are investing heavily in that, um, will we end up in an EV only, or will we end up with a bit more of a blended approach to to vehicle sales? Um, in the future and all of, all of that is in the melting pot and they're all questions that customers have um, and dealerships need to be able to equip to answer those and it's it's not an easy subject to have all the information at your fingertips is it something that's that's best communicated face to face or can that marketing it's, material it's, help out? as with anything I, I think it's a blend of both yeah. uh, I think you yeah. need to give people time and space to go away read and digest information themselves which is best done online with clicks to look at things and understand things and then ask questions about, but then when they do come in armed with what they think is their research and what they think they know, they're looking for that confirmation from the person sat the other side of the desk to say, am yeah. I right in thinking that? Um, and that's where the person on the other side of the desk needs to, to have all that knowledge and, and be able to, 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 to give them that. Or the person on the end of a phone, if it's an after sales you know, question, um, the person on the end of the phone, you know, why do I need to bring my EV for service? There's no oil to change. Well, mm. it still has wheels, it still has brakes, it still has suspension, it still has pollen filters, you know, all of these, all of these areas that get action at a normal ice service but all people think about is the oil and filter change because mm. um, that's easy that's easy it's definable it's that's you know black it's horrible you need that out of your engine if i don't have that with my car what else do you need to do to my car why do you need to see my car i would say though that um through the fact that the vast i think every car now that is produced can be a connected car that the oems could convey that via the yeah. connected car yeah. um, and we and uh, Tom you and I have spoken about it one of the things that we've heavily invested in is connectivity and um, it's we, we've now for the last 18 months been paranoid about connecting obviously the new car any used car that we sell and any car that comes in for service that hasn't been connected and um with um certainly with the with the Audi brand and the Volkswagen brands, we can then get alerts before the customer actually knows yeah. that an event is to take place. Yeah. Um and then through a, a good contact center process, we can contact the customer and say to you, Mr. Sharp, do you realise that your car is now due an oil change? Your light will come on in the next ten days. Um but um the fact is, would you like to book in on Tuesday of next week or Thursday? Um, and what we're finding is that we are able, when when that alert comes to us, 
we are able to convert over 70% of those customers and over 90% of them actually turn up for the event, which is groundbreaking compared to when we used to use an algorithm such as Polk, where if we were contact if we were contacting a customer, we if we were lucky, but one in five in. Mm. Um, and it is only now, 18 months later, that we are starting to see really positive effects of things that are happening in, in our workshop. Uh, interestingly enough, at a time when getting technicians has never been harder. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, absolutely. absolutely. At, at the same time as this connectivity piece is happening and the, and the marketing communications becoming more sophisticated, reaching out in more directions than ever before, how much of a concern as I'll come to you first, Peter, these, um, you know, the, the cyber attacks that we've seen over the last 12 months, I would say, and I'm, I'm told it's it's an escalating trend or threat, rather. Are you How talking about cyber attacks to the business? I am. I'm talking Holcro- Holcroft Group, LSH. We've mm-hmm. seen Pendragon, clearly very high profile case, and latterly Arnold Clark. Um, and we've spoken to a lot of those groups. And, you know, there is... An awful lot of things. Do you want to tell me? Do you want me to tell you how scared I am? Go for it. Frightened to death. Okay, so much so that um, we had a board meeting six months ago, and we looked at our IT, and uh, we had a professional come in and said, "Look, if at one end you've got a corner shop and their IT, and at the other end you've got the CIA." On a scale of one to ten, where do we fall? And this was six, seven months ago. Um, and we were shocked at the answer that we were uh, we were given. Um, so much so that we have committed to spend. And remember, when we're a private private company, um, it's a family business. We are spending over five million pounds over the next five years on. Um, upgrading our IT and I turned around as did brother David to the the guy who was giving us the big sell and said right so does that mean we're bomb proof he went no we're not so for those people who have been attacked I feel desperately sorry for them Um, and it's very very difficult I just think that you've just got to do the best you possibly can but you know Four weeks ago, our system on a Saturday morning went down and I got a telephone call to say the entire system was down and my heart sunk because I thought, oh, I hope for goodness sake that we've not yeah. had a cyber attack. Now, fortunately, we hadn't. But, you know, there but for the grace of God. And it's go, not go just... any of us. If it can happen to the mighty Arnold Clark, Absolutely. it can happen to you anybody. Know, you know, we've, we've sort of long respected for their tech resources well i I've, I've been up i've been up uh, to uh, their uh, their head office fortunately i got invited up by uh, by eddie hawthorne and and i was blown away by their tech so you know if they can get attacked it's open season for any of us absolutely i guess it's right up there on your list of priorities uh, top of the list. yeah top of the list i mean we've been an iso um 27001 <clears throat> registered company for a number of years now but that is that has to constantly evolve um, daily, weekly, monthly. That is not a standard you can u- achieve and then pat yourself on the back and wait until, you know, recertification comes around next no. year. You have to be, it, it's you know, our um, weekly ops board meetings, it's on the agenda, security is on the agenda. Um, it's constantly evolving. And you just look outside of automotive and the big companies that have that have been hit. Um, if it can happen to, to major global brands uh, ac- across the world, it can happen to anyone. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a constant, uh, you know, as a, as a marketing tech company um, who takes customer data in from, you know, many Many, many dealerships it's top, i'll tell you what is going to happen and sorry to to interrupt but um if you if you look at sort of like uh, our friend mr kendrick from uhy hacker young and they go and do due diligence on a business and usually it's financial due diligence they'll now be doing it due diligence and they you know the the, the you might look at a business that's okay making good profits but actually their it is archaic 
and you could turn around and say, look, actually, this isn't a viable business. Yes, you are making this profit, but to protect yourself, you need to be spending X, Y, Z. And it's always a big number. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's always a big number. And and I, um, the next time we buy a business, I will be doing IT due diligence. It's It's phenomenal, but it's phenomenal how much... It's central. It's core to the sector now. Absolutely yeah. core, and that's recent years. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'll swing around to it. You, I mean, you guys are working now in a digital sphere that you probably never thought you would as recently as three to four years ago. Yes. So, what what do you make of, uh, I guess the the wax and wane of the disruptors that have that have come and gone and and now leave. Um, not just yet, but they're, they're leaving a, a, an increasing slice of that market, it seems, back to the traditional retailer now. Well, obviously, Tom, you're talking about Kazoo. Let's not... Um, well, there's been there's been a few, to be fair. There have. There's, there's been, been a been, few. Yeah, and, there's been you know, Kazam. big case. Yeah, um, yeah. And, 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 you know, obviously, um, uh, if, 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 you, if you look at... Um, uh, at Constellation, they, uh, they they like to be extremely open about everything they do. Um, I say that very much tongue in cheek, um, but uh, and and so you only once a year get to find out how since you're really doing. Um, wh- one thing is for sure, um, whatever you like to say, and it's all been said about Mr. Chesterman and Kazoo. They give it a right good go. <laughs> they spent a billion pounds. And I think now they've taken on a new a chief executive officer, Jonathan Dunkley, um, and he is a car supermarket man um, and been very, very successful at that. You ask yourself the question, are they going to actually, where do I see Kazoo going? I think they're just going to be a used car supermarket like Big Motoring World, like Motor Point, uh, like Fords of Winsford or Dace Motor Company. I don't think they're any different, really. Um, and it's been proven um, that, uh, first of all, we're a very, very resilient set of people, um, obviously up for a fight. Um, and I think one of the reasons we're up for the fight is because of the way that Kazoo told us that the business was broken um, everybody was getting an awful uh, service um, and that they were going to change everything. And yeah, that that got my shackles up, as it did most people within the trade. Um, but I think they will just end up as a very average used car supermarket. I think just just to to wrap up in a way, I suppose, then, it, you know, that, that agility, that, that ability to change the market and evolve to new threats, new opportunities, where does that leave Swan's Way this year? Uh, Peter, what we're we going to see that's that's new from the group, and you know what what's the promising opportunity going ahead? The promising opportunity for us is used car acquisition. Uh, we are uh, working on some very exciting stuff at this moment in time with regard to acquiring used cars. Not in the same way as we buy any car um, dot com because we couldn't h- hope to uh, compete with uh, with that. Um, but uh, in a, I'd like to think an innovative way. Um, we're looking to grow our motor match business. Um, last year we sold four thousand cars through motor match. We're looking to double that to eight thousand cars within the next twenty four months. Um, And that will help insulate any negativeness we may or we may not get from agency. But at this moment in time, I am struggling to see um, how a dealer who is quite aggressive, and I think it's fair to say that Swans we are with all the franchises that we work with, how we can be better off from the agency model. So obviously we've got to counteract that. And... um, the market for used cars is huge. Uh, we have learnt an awful lot through our motor match journey, um, and we we recognise that it's totally, totally different to selling used cars through a franchise dealership. Um, it's a totally different mindset. You have to have totally different kinds of people with a totally different um, uh, uh, mindset. Although still maintaining our values of caring, honest, and proud. 
Great stuff. Well, best of, best of luck you. with that. <laughs> it's, it sounds like a big gap to fill. That's the concern now. So I'm, it, it, I'm it, it will be, It will be a big gap to fill. But the good thing about used cars is if you can turn them, if you can sell them and you can make 15, 1600 pounds a unit and you can do a lot of them, it generates cash very quickly. Yeah. And the cash comes into your bank account an awful lot quicker than it does working for an OEM where you're waiting for months for factory bonuses. Yeah, yeah. And Jeremy, uh, I guess lots uh, lots of opportunity by the sounds of it for you, yeah. you, you heading in uh, similar similar direction, but in slightly different guise, maybe going forward. Um, I think similar direction. Uh, I think it's uh, it's that constant evolution of the the customer touch points as as the market changes, as the um, as franchise dealers more you move more into used cars. The the touch points again are different. EV touch points are different. I think it's for us it's that flexibility to be able to manage the different models that are in in play at the minute, mm. often for the same client um, with different touch points. Um, rather than analyze the death, things to death, mm-hmm. well, well, let's just do it and see what happens. Again, if, if you look at Elon Musk with his other business, um, SpaceX, you look at the number of rockets of his that have blown up or imploded or whatever they've done, because they, they, he will fail quickly and he'll learn an awful lot more from it. You know, he, if the might of Boeing, who um, went to the moon decades ago, can't get their spaceship to the International Space Station before the bloke who invented PayPal can. Then there's something in this fail quickly. <laughs> there's something in this. Try and eat, you know, look what he's done with Tesla. Um, so yeah, not not analyze things to death. Try things. If they work, great. Do it again. If they don't, change it. Do something differently. Um, and, and that's quite an exciting thing for me in the industry at the minute. In that we can chop and change and try different things, different models, different contact plans within the same business. Um, Begs the question whether an OEM's prepared to fail quickly. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it does, or whether they can afford to. to be yeah. Fair. Gentlemen, we all thought it had calmed down after COVID, didn't we? Did <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not, not really. Jeremy, Peter, thanks ever so much for joining us. Pleasure, been a, thank been you. A, been a great, been great episode and uh, I look forward to seeing it myself, watching it back. Excellent. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Cheers, Tom. thank you.